And hello, everyone. I am Deborah Pascali Bonaro of Orgasmic Birth, and I am so honored to be here today, especially on International Midwives Day. This is really special. For me, midwives have been a part of my life for so, so long. When I think about our midwives, I have to first thank my midwives. Um, I, I hope that many of you that are watching have a story of a midwife that really changed your life. And I know that when my midwife really believed in me and gave me the power to birth, that like, boom, uh, opened up my life. And then I work with so many midwives around the world. Some of you know that I work every year with Ibu Robin Lim in Bali. So Robin, if you're out there, I'm calling you out because I just the work that she does, Vicki Penwell, so many midwives are out there right now working in very challenging situations, especially with COVID-19 all over the world. They have really shown us um, the power of midwifery care and how much it's needed so that every pers person feels safe and supported in birth. So with that, I have to say I'm really honored today to have a very, very special guest and special midwife here with us. Um, I met Alejandra a few years ago when she invited me with another colleague, Teresa, to come to Mexico and to speak about orgasmic birth. And little did I know at the time how much she would capture my heart with her story. And I know you're all going to really enjoy hearing her journey with birth. She's not only a Lamaze teacher trainer and a doula, but she is a midwife and she is part of our orgasmic birth team. She is the director of our community. So if you're following us on social media, it's her wisdom, grace, and humor, and beauty that is really shining through on those networks. And I wanted to feature her today to share a powerful story of working with traditional midwives in Mexico. And traditional midwives have always had such a sp special place in my heart. I've been blessed to travel and meet traditional midwives and attend births with them in different countries but to know Alejandra that you really are learning and sharing and growing and supporting and really leading the way for midwifery in many special ways in Mexico it's my deep honor to celebrate you today and welcome you so welcome wow that was a super beautiful intro <laughs> thank you so much Deborah. As you say, well, I'm feeling very, very, very happy to be collaborating with Debra in the team. It's, it's such an honor for me to be part and, and I'm very happy to, to share this story with you because it's my story. <laughs> I, I, it's the first time that I write my story and, and I realized that it's been almost seven years of, of this path, you know, uh, walking and walking to, to this this big knowledge that that, I, that we have to like to to understand and to and to be part to protect the the care the the health of the woman so it's been an amazing journey sometimes difficult sometimes easy but beautiful <laughs> i will never regret regret about anything of the choice any one of the choices choices that i made so i will start Presenting myself, my name is Alejandra Lozano. I'm 33, five, 33 years old. Um, right now, I'm living in Chiapas, in the south of Mexico. But I, but I am from Monterrey. I am from Monterrey. It's in the north of Mexico, very close to the United States. A very American city. Very, we have like there, we have a lot of hospitals, big hospitals with a lot of technology. So it's very hard to find midwives there. They are actually just two recognized midwives. And those two midwives were at my birth. And when I first met a midwife, the first midwife that I met in my life, I was like in shock and I was very 
very touch <laughs> because I didn't know midwives exist, you know, because <laughs> I was pregnant and I was searching for a home birth. And when I met them, I say, I say to myself and I say it aloud, the midwife put the, put a strange face, you know, like what? Because I say to her, I want to become a midwife. I forget about my birth, my birth and my birth lands. And I say to her, I want to be a midwife. And she was like, okay. And your home birth. <laughs> and well, I have a, a very intense home birth with her and her mentor. Her mentor name is Dori Silva. And she became my, my mentor also. When my son has uh, two years, we start this path together. Well, she, she decides to teach me. So I was, uh, well, I start a uh, going to the birds and everything was perfect. All the birds came in a perfect way. We never have like these uh, obstetric emergencies or this hemorrhage or, or this shoulder dystocia or this type of problems that are very common to see in an hospital. If you go to a hospital to to an hospital, you can see statistics. So we were working for about four years and a half together and, and with women, and we never have these situations. And and I was very happy learning with her because I was first observating birds, and then at the end I was already attending the birds. And my mentor was always by my side. She was always there. Like she have she's a very strong woman. Midwives are always very strong, <laughs> and she have this uh, always this phase, you know, like it's okay, you can do it, you can go, go, do it, or, or you know, you have to do this, or but just with the look, we have like this understanding. So she she was always with me, and it was a very nice way to to learn midwifery. That's the way that I understand how to how to learn midwifery it can it can be in another way for me <laughs> so she was always beside me teaching me guiding me with love and i was very happy but at the end i'm a person that i'm always searching for more for more <laughs> so i decide to move to chiapas to move to chiapas because in the south of mexico chiapas is a very important thing uh, about midwifery because it's like the place where midwifery it is still working it is still going so i had to go to to chapas to to find out what's the the traditional midwife about you know what how, what is this this magic that they have so i decided i decide to let everything in mexico i i take my kid and i went to chapas to start another chapter of, of my life. When I moved to Chiapas, I entered a diploma. A diploma, this diploma was about obstetric emergencies and midwifery. So I had the chance to mix the, with the, the knowledge. So they teach me about clinical stuff, like neonatal resuscitation, resuscitation about how to handle an hemorrhage, how to handle uh, shoulder dystocia and all the emergencies that can happen in a birth. So they teach me how to handle and, and the skills to to manage these situations. And I also start um, uh, so I also start being part of a very important movement uh, in Chiapas. There's a there's a movement called Nichi Chim. Nichi Chim means corn flower in Sotzil. So this movement have already 800 midwives, traditional in 90%, working together to, to learn more about the rights. They don't want to learn about how to be a midwife. They don't want to learn how to, to handle uh, emergencies. They already have that far, but they want to understand how, how to, to protect against the government because they, they need to understand the laws that protect them, the rights that they have to attend women at home. So they are getting together to, to learn more about this, to learn about their, their rights and to be in power, to empower together, to en empower the boys, to empower how, how to ask things to the authorities of the communities and the government 
because midwife suddenly becomes in a political movement and we have to be very strong to to go inside the political movement it's, it's a very difficult difficult <laughs> a difficult part of the world <laughs> so is the first uh, this, this time movement, it was is this the first time they've come together and organized to be more political? The, yes, well, there's a lot of movements already working, but this is a very huge one because they are already 800 midwives. So they are working in every municipality of the state, working with the leaders because in every community they have a leader. And they have to talk with them and they have to understand how the things work in that community. And, and they have to have these like, um, like roads directly to the hospital. They have to be respected in the community so they can have more help there. So yes, it's the first big, big movement. So I'm very happy to be part of it. And well, since of this, uh, this movement, I had the opportunity to meet a lot of midwives, a, a lot of traditional midwives. And I really, it's very impressive because they have another way of seeing life. It's a different way. It's a, it's a way that is like, I have to get used to it because they have like a, a confidence that is, they, are, they believe that everything is going to be right. They have like this gift from God that's what the thing that that they say they have this gift and they they are in their hands and they they start working and they never feel like uncomfortable they never fear fear they never feel fear they are always trusting on the knowledge that they receive because they receive the knowledge from their mothers from their grandmothers and some from dreams they just dream about midwifery, in not, not just midwifery, you know, you know, just also about how to handle different situations. They have very specific dreams. They dream sometimes like, oh, I have this dream about how to handle when the car is in the neck. And they dream this, and I think it's something very special that they have. I think I, I never met anyone else in every other profession that have this way to learn and i'm i'm not sure it's is is if is it specific for mexican traditional midwives from mexico or from an all over the world but it, but it's a, a very special gift they have you know because they they also learn some specific things about herbs and different plants and how to use it and, and what is this air for and how to 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 handle this air i don't know they learn a lot of things because they don't have they don't have the books they don't have uh, the internet they they don't have computers they just have their knowledge and their trust and their their feeling of of being of being there available for every woman that needs their help so it's, it's very interesting because midwifery in Chiapas is not about money. It's not a profession that you want to do because you want to be rich. It's, it's about giving. It's about, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, they, they don't win anything. They don't win money. They, they are families that don't have any money to give them. And they offer a chicken to, to, to make a soup, to make a, something good for it. So midwifery here is, is a very, it's a very beautiful profession, but it's a, you have to, to be all for women. You have to, to, to be for them. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think it's quite unique of traditional midwives, but I think midwives in general around the world, right? It's not something you go in for money, you go in for the heart and the love and the care and to make a difference. But I love how you talked about that they have the wisdom handed down from grandmother, right? To mother, to them, and also the dreams. And I'm I find that fascinating because I think that many midwives that I've worked with, and I think some doulas, some of us, that when we're so deeply connected in this work as you are, that the ability 
to have, whether it's a dream or intuition or connection um, in this way, I see a lot. Like I see much more in people that are deeply connected because for me, birth is that sacred gateway, right? Of life coming in. And there is something about the veil kind of between worlds being thin or the angels there are every in different traditions and different beliefs there are different words but i loved hearing you say that how they they acquire that wisdom um in so many ways that we don't think about when we're so entrenched in being just in our thinking brain right in books and in technology what are some of the things that is there something that stands out to you, like a birth that you did with them that really was the most special to you? Well, I have a, a well, I, I was in a birth. Well, this is, well, I have a different, different stories. <laughs> awesome. But I have, <laughs> okay, I remember one in Monterey with Doris that I want to share that it was a, we attend a, a birth and it was a, an orgasmic birth. And I want to, to share that, that story. And I remember it was, it was a long story. It, it was a long birth, sorry. We've been with the woman about three days and it was very, it was a very slow, low, low birth. So, but, but fine. And at the end, when she was finally in the last stage of birth, she was about to give birth to her son. She started to feel like, like she was very connected with her baby. You know, like the, the contraction, it was going to come. And she already feel it like the baby was telling her that I'm going, I'm going there. So she was like, okay, I'm here. I'm ready for you. I, I'm going to help you. And when the contraction came, she was working together with the baby. And suddenly she started feeling this, this, these sensations in the vagina, these sensations very similar to an orgasm. And it was for her like, oh my God, what, what am I feeling? This is like having sex. <laughs> and she looked at us and we saw like, everything's fine, you go, you keep going, you keep breathing, we are here, <laughs> but, but everything's fine, you know? You're just, just trying like, to do a face like, okay <laughs> to know to to make her more comfortable right and she she let go and she felt these sensations in the vagina and she said wow this is like having sex and then the, the baby goes out and he was like wow this is an orgasmic bird <laughs> it's an amazing it's an amazing thing that we experience all together because all the midwives already have learning about it from Debra <laughs> and he was like wow we did it we, we are right now in an orgasmic bird <laughs> but but what I think is like all the birds that we attend at home have this particular thing like you can feel free you can feel free, very comfortable when I attend a bird when a, with a traditional midwife I'm working right now with one her name is Doña Caridad Doña Caridad is also a very, very strong woman. I don't know why I always <laughs> work with very strong women, but she's like, she's very trusty and she always touch the belly and touch a woman and she says, okay, she's fine. And in my mind, I have this mind because I search a lot for scientific evidence and stuff like that. And she says like, forget about it. She's fine. And, and you can look at her face that she's fine and the baby is fine, and everything is going to, fit, to be fine. So let's go, let's go, and let's, uh, let's um, and we need to, to give her the space to, to be her, to, to be, to, to, to be her. <laughs> so it's been a very intense transition for me to change of being in a very technological, technological city to be in Chiapas where you have to feel, you have to trust, because you don't have a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of resources if, if something happens. So you have to, to be ready. You have to be ready to attend a bird in a home, because sometimes birds are very far from a hospital. So it's better if you do things there, that if you go with a woman to an hospital. 
And right now, because of the COVID situation, more women are coming with us to, to have their homeworks because they feel scared. They feel scared of being at the, at the, at the hospital and without any family, any, any family. So it's getting very intense right now because of that. <laughs> and how many births do you do a month or how many births do each of the midwives usually attend? Well, depends. Right, right here in the city, it's almost two to three, not much. Depends. Right now, the, the colleagues, our colleagues in the communities have a lot of births. They are attending like, I don't know, maybe five, six a month. But this is because of the situation. We have this problem here in, in Chiapas with, um, there was a problem, a, a program, uh, a health program called uh, Seguro Popular. In this program of the government, it was um, produced a problem for the midwives because if the woman went to the midwives, then the program uh, closed the door for her. For them so the midwives start having less work less work less less woman um, searching for them and now the program ends and they, with the COVID <laughs> the midwives are having so it's a it's a no it's COVID but this is a positive thing for them because they're starting to have more work because the people trust in them trust more in them than to go to an hospital right now so Change are happening because of the situation, but I think sometimes it's, it's a good change. Yes, I agree. I think that's going to be the kind of silver lining of COVID is that it's really helping us to re-examine healthcare systems and look at midwifery in all different ways. But I'd love to open, I know many of you have joined us here and if you have a question, you can either put it in the chat or feel free if your microphone is working and you'd like to open it up or open up your camera and ask. Does anyone have a question that you'd like to ask? Hi, I have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you for giving your presentation. It was like very interesting to hear about the work you guys are doing. And it sounds like very important work. Um, I was wondering, the, the traditional midwives in Chiapas, you said that they're trying to organize to advocate um, for more kind of like a government structure to practice. Um, I was curious, like, what is the status of that and what is their ultimate goal? Do they want some kind of kind of like an official licensure to be recognized or what would they like? Well, they are making some writing about what they want to share with the government, some letters. They always make letters expressing how, what they are, what their needs are. And they send this letter to the, to the leaders of the communities. And then we have to move to the state leaders and then to federal leaders. And it's a, it's a very difficult to, thing to do in Mexico because we already sent like five different letters and we don't have any answers. So the political um, leaders are not putting attention in, in midwifery. They don't want to see because their midwives are also working right now without protection, without, um, without, how do you say? With, without protection. Uh, and, and they are like risking their lives with a woman and they are not going to stop working. But there's a, there's a situation. We have a lot of traditional midwives having more than 60 years. So they are sometimes already sick and they can get more sick. And the government is very sad because they, they don't, we are going to keep trying. We are going to keep trying. We also have this radio, radio cap um, how do you say we make some some uh, how, how do you say that 
capsules for radio. Oh, like a so podcast? They, they, so, ah, a podcast, yes, for radio, sorry. So, so the people in the community can know all the work that the Midwest are doing, but still the government is, is like saying, yes, we need more midwives, but they don't have any program to include the midwives in the, in the, in the government healthcare services. So they are just saying things and they are not doing like specific steps to really add the, the midwifery, the midwives to the, to the healthcare system. So we, I'm actually right now, well, I was, um, before the COVID, I was working in a voluntary, voluntary program in the maternal hospital in Chiapas. So the Red Cross, it was trying to add the midwives to, the, to this hospital to attend the first stage of birth. Because in Chiapas, there's a lot of community very far from the hospital. So the, the woman came with a very late, late labor, a very, yes, a late labor, the first stage of first labor. First stage of labor. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So they can come back to the communities. So the, we invite them to pass with us and we try to give them some comfort measures, some massages, some movement, rebozo and stuff like that because they will go they will they need to wait they can come back but we have to stop that program because of the COVID. so i think this is going to to go back i don't know maybe in two months i'm not sure right now but it's a it's a way to to start adding our, our services to the system to the health system but it's a very difficult because we are now we can attend birds but they are just they just want to have us there for for the first stage of labor and well mm -hmm. it's a way to start they have to get used to it to us <laughs> yeah well, well i'm curious what the um like the attitude of the more like medical community is for with like having traditional midwives kind of come into the hospital were they welcoming or were they not really sure what to do they, they are not welcome. The traditional midwives, they are always like, um, they are always like, it's, it's a very, it's a very bad situation, you know, because they have a lot of discrimination, gender discrimination, and also because they are indigenous, they receive bad mistreatment. They are, they are always feeling like guilty because I was, I have this experience in the hospital that was very, very, very sad for me because I was in a bird that had this situation, this hemorrhage um, emergency. The, the woman started to bleed a lot. And the medical staff came and they had these protocols to attend the woman and everything at the end was fine. But when the doctor was, went to talk to the family, the doctor says to the family, it was the fault of the midwife because the midwife did something bad on her and that's why she started to bleed and i was like what is she talking about the midwife decides to send the woman to the hospital because she knew something was it was going to happen like the birth is going not going to happen here in the, in the farm so the midwife decides to send the woman to the hospital and then the, the answer to, from the hospital is telling the woman it is telling the family that it was a midwife guilt. So that was what, like, for me, it was like, what is happening? The midwives are trying to do the right job. And then you have this political, this, this public, uh, this medical staff trying to, to, to talk bad about them. So it's a very, very sad situation because they have this, this, this bad ideas. They think like the midwives have dirty hands, and they don't know anything and they just use, use herbs and they don't have any information, but they really know. They use their insti instincts to, to understand when the woman is going to give birth there. And if some troubles are, are starting to happen, they decide to translate this woman to, to take this woman to the hospital and then they receive this, you know? It's like, okay, so then what, what do I have to do? as a midwife. If I do my job right 
and then you you're telling me that I'm not yes they suffer a lot of discrimination a lot a lot a lot that's a, that's a really big problem here not that the midwives don't want to take the woman to the hospital is it is it is the political posture of the hospital saying like no 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 we don't want this woman because this woman was attending attended first for a midwife so if something happened to that woman we're gonna have to to have problems so they decide to 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 let to let the woman alone and say go to another hospital because you already went with a midwife and we can have problems because of you so then one then we have woman that that suddenly died because of that because of this this important mo uh, time of taking the woman to an emergency to attend an emergency in an hospital so it's a very sad situation because we don't have this this right communication with them mm -hmm. they don't want us <laughs> but yeah. but actually <laughs> it's a very sad because we are trying to this to make this you know, this communication is better because we need all, we need the medical staff, we need the nurses, we need the, the pediatricians. We know that, we, we know that we have to be a team, but between being a team and want to be a team, you know, it's a, it's a very long, long way mm -hmm. still right now. Are they, um, like, do the midwives have, are they allowed to, I don't know, like, purchase or use, like, some emergency medications, like oxytocin or misoprostol? Like, are they able to have access to that or no? Yes. Well, the last uh, birth that I attended, I was looking for oxytocin, and it was really difficult to find oxytocin. I, I finally get it, but it was very difficult to, to buy some at the... At the, at the source, because there's a, a bad thing that sometimes, well, in the past, um, some programs came to try to, to teach the midwives how to use the oxytocin, how to use the misoprostol and other, other medic, uh, medications. But midwives start, some of the midwives, not all, start using the oxytocin at the beginning of the of the labor. Mm -hmm. So then if you go to a, um, a medical store to buy oxytocin, they start looking at you like, are you going to use it to start labor? And we have to say, no, this is just for an emergency, it's for a protocol, and we need this medicine to, to be available for us. But we have this, this bad situation because in the past there was this these programs of education, but really bad programs because they don't understand, they really, use bad oxytocin and that's a big problem that may makes a lot of um, emergency to to occur when they use the oxytocin in that way yeah. so i was also learning well in here in chapa there's a lot of uh, a lot of workshops to to teach midwives and how to handle emergencies so i went to to one workshop with traditional midwives and they were teaching us how to use the oxytocin, but they never, like, they, are, they were teaching, like, oxytocin is a medicine that it, it can be available for you. But the, the best thing to do is to understand when you have to take that woman to the hospital. That's where we have to, that's the thing that we have to, to learn better, when to take that woman to the hospital when the birth can be more complicated. Uh, in the diploma that I take, I learned how to use the, the oxytocin and misoprostol and all. But not all the midwives have this education. The traditional midwives don't have this, this education about the oxytocin and, and some other medicaments. Medics. Thank you. Yes, yeah, such important questions, right? And I think your comment about transport, of being part of a team, this is a problem to all over the world for midwives, transporting from home to hospital where they're not 
respected, where there's not a team approach and where blame or lack of care filters down to the woman. And that's what can make home birth unsafe is not having that collaboration. So it's sad to hear, but it's good to know that you've got the group of midwives together, 800 strong, and sending letters and petitioning yeah. to build that strength and increase that network. Yes, they, they actually have one letter for today. It's in Spanish, but I will try to, to make a translate in English and maybe you can, you can, have, you can know what are their needs and you can, you can understand more of, of, the, of the work or, or how they are doing it today because they are still working and they are not going to stop. They just want to be, they just want to feel, you know, respected and they just want to feel to be recognized and they just want to have quality health care services that are the three things that they they want and they need because they are like you know they they take care of the health of all the community not just the women they also talk about sexuality they take care about postpartum they take care, take care about the babies, about the little kids, about the, girl, the girls, and all. So they have a very, very big job in the communities, and it's very important. We, we lost this, this reference in our, in our new towns. <laughs> we don't have any person to ask about it. You have to go to a medic, and sometimes it's not what you need. You just have to ask with someone that offers you some different ways of healing, you know? And now it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. In Monterey, for example, just two midwives. <laughs> There's a lot of people living there for just two midwives. You know, it's like, what are we going to do? We have to have more midwives. <laughs> Definitely more midwives. Is there anyone else that would like to ask a question? We have time for probably one or two more questions before we end for now. And feel free to put it in the chat if you'd rather type or open a mic if you'd like to open. Hello, Hanko. Um, are the midwives able to use the herbs in place of like the oxytocin? Do they have that yes. at their toolkit? Yes, they, they have a lot of herbs. Actually, there's a special herb here. The name is Misto. And Misto helps uh, with the contractions to be more intense and also can help to, to finish or to end the blood if there's an hemorrhage. And they have special herbs uh, from here in the south of Mexico that can help. They also sometimes use homeopathy, but not all the time. They, act, they always use herbs for different things different they also use something some things from the animals you know um there's a, a thing that they do um when the kid is born they you know they have to cord the the umbilical cord they have to make the cord the um, they have to cut the cord <laughs> uh-huh and they use some uh let me check they use some ash and this ash has to come from the from a chicken, you know, from the feather of a chicken. They burn this feather, and with this ash, they they put in the cord, and that's the the way they can start. This is going to start healing, healing you know. And it's a very interesting interesting thing because when I hear this, it was like because it has to be a black feather, and it was like. What? Why a black feather? <laughs> it can be white. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know if, if, if they are going to understand me asking this, you know, <laughs> because it was like, because it had to be that way, that way. It, it has to be black, you know? And I was like, okay, I have to be, <laughs> I have to, to shut up <laughs> because they have a different way to understand things. And I just have to understand in the same way I, you, I just have to change my mind because i can have a lot of questions because maybe if the chicken okay the black chicken maybe the black chicken is special or 
and then a lot of questions start flowing in my head and it's like no just it's just a black chicken <laughs> just the way it's just the tool they have <laughs> and that's all <laughs> you know it's, that's it's great. very interesting <laughs> well we have some more questions for you veronica says that her family lives in monterey and she's a birth doula in the mexico texas border what is the perception in the metropolitan monterey of midwives and doulas by obstetricians so what do obstetricians well, think of midwives and doulas in Monterey? Well, depends on the medical, depends. We have, a, well, I'm actually collaborating, collaborating. Oh, I have a collaboration with a center in Monterey. The name is Centro Mai. And we, we also have this good relationship with some of the doctors. But at the end, they have this, like, we don't have any doctors that say midwives woohoo you know they are the best and we trust them we don't have this type of doctors in make in monterey it's very sad but we have some of them that always say like our job is is very important and and, and they need our job to do it but we have we have a list of medics and we have only 10 doctors in that list and this is very sad because only certain doctors are happy to work with doulas and midwives. And we have a lot of women there. So we need to, I don't know, we need to do something about, about it in the cities specifically. Because in here it's very normal. The, the midwives are like, you know, 800, it's a lot. In Monterey too, they, they have a very different perspective from doulas. So it depends on the doctor. If you, if you are working with a doctor that's very like, like, like that attend a respected birth, he's going to be happy with the doula and midwives. But if it's not some of them, it's not going to happen. They have a bad perception, perception about doulas. They actually think that maybe they will like be observing and judging the job they do and something like that and, and things like that. Thank you, and sad to hear, but as we know, so many places in the world, right? This is where it begins and it takes time for that change to happen, right? For both midwives and doulas to be reintegrated. That's why in the places that never lost midwifery, right? They're really blessed because once you lose something, it's so much harder to bring it back in, right? And midwives, not being in the hospital in Mexico is really a challenge. And then doulas too. You have a great question here. Um, thank you for the important information shared today. You mentioned postpartum care. I'm curious to know, does this include a 40 day of healing? I practice this and have seen this in midwives in Colombia. I think that's a great well, question because you have such great traditions for postpartum. I love postpartum traditions. I, that's, I, I, it's like the best to do this postpartum, offer this postpartum care because it includes, you know, all the massages, all the rebozo calls, all the baths with the flowers in the air. So yes, they, they offer this, this postpartum care. The first that they do is at the, at the 24 hours, they offer a bath. And then at the, it can be at the third day or the five day, they go to the house and offer another bath. It can be at the fifth day or eighth, depends. Because depends on every woman, depends on how the bird goes and where the community is. So all the midwives have different plans. They, they, if you just sit to talk with different midwives from different communities, they all use different herbs. So it's very hard because one herb can can have like five different names so <laughs> you okay this is what is this herb that you use and sometimes are the same sometimes not so they are very good care they take a good care of, of women in the postpartum with the beds they also make the food for them they make a lot of chicken soup <laughs> and they also make these massages and and try to to keep the woman hot because the postpartum is a special moment in, in the life where, where you, your body had to take all the heat and, and be all this and have a, a warm things 
above and, and with the clothes and with your baby. You have to be warm. You have to be, your body have to be, have to keep, have to keep the hot inside. So that's the thing the midwives do. Always are, are trying to do this with the foot, with the herbs, with the baths, and with the massages. So it's a, it's a very interesting thing. It's a very beautiful thing to see because you need it. When you are in postpartum, you need to be, to have this touch, to have this care, and it doesn't have it. It doesn't happen in the cities. It's, it's, very, it's, a very special, it's a very special care that the midwives offer in this community. Oh, thank you. Anyone else for one last question before we say good night? Because it's so nice, Alejandra, to have your wisdom, to have all your sharing of these traditions and supporting the midwives and being a midwife there and bringing that bridge between the traditional and the hospital. And I really, I hope you'll let us know more in the letter if there are ways we can all support in any way. Um, I don't know if there's a place to contribute financially or if signing anything would help, but you can let us know so we can let everyone here know too how we can better support you and the midwives. I will. I will send something where you can, I don't know, support her because they, they right now need protection to attend birth in this COVID situation. That's why they just need. And when you say protection, you mean the protective like masks and face and, yes, and, and gloves. And, and, and if, if we contribute financially, can you buy that there or do they really need it's not accessible there. We can buy some here. We okay. already we have a, actually in Chiapas uh, very very cheap to buy, but they don't have uh, sometimes the money to do it. Do it. But I, I will be happy to do it if you okay. want to contribute in that way. That would be fantastic because it's nice to see a way that we can contribute um, and support. Yeah. So we'll yes, definitely we'll let all of you here know in case you would like to contribute in any way for being with us tonight. Any oh, last? Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you know, I was curious, like, could the midwives use um, records that they've kept to show the government, like, how great of a track record they've had all these years? Is well, that's what we're trying to do. We are trying to collect all this data of the attentions they give, all the prenatal cares, all the birth they attend, all the postpartum care. They are trying to, to collect all this information. And they actually, we actually put this information into pesos, into money. So, so the, the government can understand how much money midwives are like saving to them uh, taking care about the woman so we already have this information this is collected uh, until the last uh, data was collected on february so we already have this information and we want to to take this to the government and say hey we are here we are working we have no maternal death registrations and we are saving you money <laughs> and you have to see us. You have to understand that our job is very important because there's a thing here when a baby born uh, in the, in the letter, letter, in the certificate you have, mm -hmm. there's an option where you can put that the birth was attended by a midwife or a doctor. And when, they, when they, the midwives take the woman to the hospital, they always write like doctor. So when you see like the public statistics, you see like there's no births being attended by, by midwives. And it's a really a lie because the information is not right. That's why we decide to start these statistics to show the government, okay, this is a job. This is what we are doing. And we have like these certificates with the, with the print of the baby foot 
and and the 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 finger of the woman so they they have all this evidence and that's great <laughs> that's a really important job that we are doing as a movement to to trying to be like we have all this all this data <laughs> you can say no <laughs> Great question, and thank you. So thank you so much again, Alejandra. Thank you for everyone for making time to be with us and to ask questions and be a part of this. We will send you out a follow-up email so you can contribute and um, learn more ways of offering support to the midwives there. And to all the midwives who are with us and listening later to Happy International Midwives Day, Thank you, midwives, and Alejandra, for all that you do. Um, midwives are so important, and for all of us that support you, we love you. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time, you know, to do this. I'm very happy. I feel very honored. I hope this information can work for, can, can, I don't know, I don't know if this information is good for you. And I'm happy to be here, but thank you so much and happy midwifery day. <laughs> Fantastic.